talk and I couldn't move, but I was standing and I was wide awake. So I was like, okay. So I did what felt like the most logical thing, which is like, I look in the back of the bar and I, and I just make a beeline. And in the back, there's this parking lot. And in the parking lot, there's a dumpster. And this, by the way, is the cover of one of my recent books because I wrote about this experience in the book. And the dumpster was not on fire, but I was like a dumpster fire at this point in my life. And I go and I lie down next to the dumpster and I just kind of, that's how I spent my 26th birthday. And people would come out and, um, and be like, happy birthday. And, and no one seems surprised that that's how I was spending my birthday. And at the end of the night, I don't really remember this, but I guess two friends took me, put me in their car, and put me on their couch. And that's how I came to the next morning with my friend saying, oh, you're breathing, and not sounding that happy about it. Now, that would have been that. But a funny thing happened. In fact, a few funny things. One, I realized I was an addict and I got sober. I went to rehab. And that was not November 19th. It'll be 19 years ago. I haven't had a drug or a drink since. Thank you. But the really interesting thing is I wrote a book about it. Now that book, Party Girl. So yes, writing viral nonfiction is even easier than you think and can make you thousands or even hundreds of thousands of dollars. And the secret is to use a framework that's already been proven through centuries of writing. The 3E method as discussed in our soon to be released book, not only uses that proven framework, but incorporates the important psychological principles of know, like, and trust. There we go. By the way, I have a handout for you at the end of the presentation, so you don't have to worry about taking notes, and there'll be a link for you, geniusnetwork.com slash 3E. So why should you care about writing a book? Because books have been powerful motivators for centuries and will continue to be long into the future. Even within the Genius Network, you've seen a glimpse of how powerful they can be with books from Joe Polish, Dan Sullivan, Ben Hardy, Dan Sullivan and Ben Hardy, Cameron Harold, and many others. And of course, Jim Dew in his own masterpiece, Beyond a Million. <laughs> Even Ryan Levesque at our last meeting talked about how he used books to his books to dramatically grow his business. Now, books are excellent at bringing more and better leads, which all of us could use in our business. Most nonfiction books, however, are poorly organized. They ignore stories and emotional connection. They're painful to read all the way through, thrown together from rough transcriptions, and are not fun to share. However, a nonfiction book should be, it should hold your reader's attention all the way to the end. It should build, know, like, and trust, follow a predictable structure, make them want to learn more about you, and make the reader excited to share your book. I'm about to reveal a strategy formed from over 12 years of best-selling publishing and years of top-ranking sales experience. It follows proven strategies from psychology, sales, and education. I used to be a science teacher, a high school teacher for 10 years. Here are the three core elements for creating nonfiction. The first E is emotion. So this starts in the introduction to your book, and it's where you connect with the reader's heart by relating to them, showing them you understand their problem, their pain, just as well as they do. Because remember, if you can explain their problem as well or better than they can, then they naturally believe that you can solve that problem for them as well. And the second E is entertainment. Entertainment is all about story. Your story, your customer stories, examples, and so on. Stories are powerful, as you heard in Jim's talk early, earlier, super powerful in some cases. Story starts before you start teaching because your reader first needs to know and like you 
before they can trust you. Hey, I hope you're enjoying this video and I wanna let you know that I have a new book that's come out and if you'd like to get it absolutely free, there's a link below in the description or you can wait till the end of this video or you can simply go to joesfreebook.com and you can get a copy there. A viral book also follows an award-winning story arc that starts at the beginning of your book, builds tension throughout, and then finishes with an emotional bang that sets your reader into action. The third E is education. Now, most books, nonfiction books, only focus on education. But if you skip the know and like stages, how on earth do you get them to trust you? And you know what they call a book that's only education? A textbook. How many people here really like to read a textbook? So people buy your book because they want to learn, but they read your book because of your story, because you've shown that you understand their problem. Now, don't worry about writing all of this down because it's in your handout. What I do want you to get from this is that all three E's work together to create action. Not just action, but massive action. One book I published included only one call to action, but this one call to action had a 62% conversion rate. Oops. A book when properly written can produce conversion rates that blow Facebook ads out of the water. How? By following the 3E method of building know, like, and trust throughout the book. Your book is your best salesperson. A book written with that 3E method will become your most effective salesperson. My business partner, Andrew, and I were both previously sales professionals, both for about 10 years each. Andrew realized that this exact same process helped him to become a top national 5%er in his old company. Imagine having thousands of salespeople on your team working one-on-one -on -one with your prospect. They're available 24 seven, so your dream client can wake up in the middle of the night and start connecting on their phone or simply open your book that engages them from the first page. And they never show up late for work, unprepared or hungover. So can you imagine the selling power if you sold even 1000 books? But to achieve any of this, you first need to use all three steps of the 3E method. Emotion, which gets your reader to know you and let them know that you know them. Entertainment, so your reader comes to like you through your shared story. And education, so your reader trusts you and sees you as an expert. When all three of these E's are connected in the correct order, your reader will be much more likely to take action. For many published authors, their book has resulted in multiple millions of dollars worth of happy readers eager to do business with them. One of the authors that we worked with went on to make close to $1 million in one year solely from his book and its content. We came up with an ingenious way to partner with a large university. Andrew and I are almost done with our own book Hook, line, and book, a story structure that catches customers and never lets them go. In this book, not only do we go into more detail about using that 3E method, we also give away our entire proven system for writing books created from years of book publishing and salesmanship. We also wrote it to be the perfect example of how to incorporate the three E's into a powerfully effective book. And for Genius Network members, just send an email to me at chris at conversionpublishing.com and I'll make sure that you get a free ebook version and a special bonus to go with it. Now, every one of us has a book inside of us, a book that will impact others. All, you, all of you have earned a tremendous amount of knowledge and expertise, and there are thousands or even hundreds of thousands of people who need to hear your message. Now, if the thought of writing an entire book sounds daunting to you, I have a few simple ideas that you can do just to get started. One, start by writing a list of your stories. You don't have to write the stories out, just create a list so that you can refer back to that. Two, write a table of contents. 
This can be the business steps you teach customers or how your products provide a specific solution. Or if you want conversion publishing to write your book for you using your existing content, just reach out to me. We all have excuses for why we can't write a book yet. This was Martin Pistorius. Martin was like any other boy playing and loving life until he was 12 years old. And when he was 12 years old, he fell into, he lost all voluntary motor control and fell into a vegetative state for three years. He began regaining consciousness around 16, but it was three more years before he gained full consciousness. And even then remained completely paralyzed except for his eyes. He was unable to communicate with anyone until his caregiver noticed that he was responding to her with his eyes. Imagine being trapped in your body for 12 years, over half of those years, fully intelligent, fully aware, but not able to move a muscle or communicate with anyone. Eventually, he was able to communicate again and slowly regained his strength. And then he met a woman and had a son and wrote a book. And to be a little vulnerable with you, I actually did cry when I read this book because it is a powerful story. So what will it take for you? Hey, I hope you're enjoying this video and I wanna let you know that I have a new book that's come out and if you'd like to get it absolutely free, there's a link below in the description or you can wait till the end of this video or you can simply go to joesfreebook.com and you can get a copy there. Especially when you're filling things when you're filling it with things that you fundamentally want to do. Right. Like you're saying about writing the book is play. You don't right. mind the writing the book. It's just the um, sitting down to actually write the book. It's right. getting, you know, putting that time aside. How, what's your strategy for that? For, right. for writing your books and getting the time organized. Like I imagine that part of your calendar is, live appointments with people who you're working with in your office or on the phone. Yeah, but that's writing that, a book. Me, I know where you're going. So let me answer the, the, yeah. uh, the seeing patients part or talking to you part right now is pure bobsled. That's pure yeah. structure. I show up at the appointed time and, and yeah. I know what I'm supposed to do when I do it. Yeah. The writing part. And, and this is what uh, most people ask me this or are befuddled when I answer it, mm. but honestly, my method is the Nike solution. I just do it. Mm. I don't know when, I don't mm -hmm. know where, but I've done it 21 times now. So I know I will do it, but mm -hmm. I don't, unlike most writers, I don't have a schedule. I don't mm -hmm. have a, a, a time that I don't have a page number I have to do every day. Right. I just sort of have this, it's the toddler on a picnic. I, I know I will do it because I love it. I also yeah. hate it. So that's why I avoid right. it. You know? And, and, uh, it's sort of like golf. You love it and you hate it. Well, writing is that way for me. I, I love it and I hate it. So I, I want to do it and I don't want to do it. And how and much of the see, deadline, how much of the deadline imposes itself? Well, I, I've, my, 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 my publishers are very charitable with me. They, uh -huh. they will always grant me extensions, but I, I want to get it done and they know I will get it done. So I yeah. don't do that for, I don't hand in something a year late or anything like mm -hmm. that. But the deadline helps somewhat. Uh, you know, I, I'm glad to have deadlines. They help me, but, but it's mostly this, and I think that's part of the creative process for most people. Uh, it requires a certain amount of freedom. And if you try and pin mm -hmm. me down, uh, you inhibit it. Uh, mm -hmm. you know? Now, if I didn't have absolute faith in myself to get it done, then I would submit to a more of a, more of a regimented structure and schedule. Mm -hmm. And that's what I recommend most people do because think I'm unusual in that way. The Nike solution, just do it, uh, just doesn't do it for, for an awful lot of people. Do you tend to block off time in your calendar though, for things like that? Like, do you, would I look on your calendar and see writing blocks no, or no, no, so no. if you fit it in, yep. uh, it happens. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's, you know, you and do a writing little bit is every day kind of thing uh, or yeah no i i write every day sure yeah. and, and it, it's a 
and it's probably the most valuable of, of all the things I do. It's certainly right. the most permanent yeah. and, uh, and the most lasting yeah. and has the widest impact. Yeah. Um, uh, so, so yeah, but it's not that I, it's not that I don't respect it. It's not that I don't give it a high priority. Right. It's my way of giving it a high priority is, is way different from, mm -hmm. from most writers or artists. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. What is okay. that? I thought the Nike solution, what does that comment say? Just do it. Oh, sorry. He's, no, he says, I thought the Nike solution was, I thought Nike's motto was just do it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I thought the Nike solution was send it to the third world and let them deal with it. <laughs> uh, nah, Speaking of, of golf, Dean, your um, golf analogy mm -hmm. in that blocked out time is one that I've always, since I heard it. Uh, That's been heard. my power move um, is I, I, you know, in exploring for myself, Ned found that um, I'm able to focus in, in situations like for blocks of time. And I thought, why is it easy for me to play golf? And I found that, you know, because I used the acronym golf, that there's a goal that I'm going to go play golf and there's an optimal environment. The golf course is optimally set up to play golf. You've got the holes are already organized. It's like the bobsled run yes. for things. Yes. There's limited distractions meaning you're on the course. If you leave your phone in the bag, you're, you're not distracted there. Right. And there's a fixed time frame. You start on the first hole, you finish on the 18th hole, and it's probably going to take you four and a half hours total. And that, you know, so I started, and I do that with movies. I can definitely focus on getting to the movies and sit through a two and a half hour movie, no problem, focused, 100% on being there. So that's been my uh, thing was blocking those times in my, uh, in my calendar to know that that's, uh, that's what I'm going to, uh, that, that I'm, I have a goal for it. This is what I'm going to do with this time. This is Joe Polish. Uh, here I am with uh, Russell Simmons. How you doing, man? Oh, man? Yeah, so great that you're here. All right, you got a new book. Yeah. Uh, Success Through Stillness. Uh, you've written a couple of books, but why this one and why now? Well, I've written, like, as you said, a number of books on happiness. And I think the number one tool has been meditation. And so I talk about you know, all the eight parts of yoga, you know, and, and the, the number one part of the, those eight parts is meditation. And people have asked me more about it. Every year I get more and more requests to, to talk about it. And I'm on the board, mm -hmm. uh, the advisory board at David Lynch Foundation. And... We're going in next month, for instance, to Chicago to try to get the mayor and the chancellor on board to get the kids to meditate in Chicago, and we're doing it all over the country. And it just seems to me that it's such a great tool, and so few people do it compared to relative to how many people need it. In fact, everyone needs it, but some people are in desperate need. They're doing medication where they could be doing meditation. That is a very good thing to, to get people to meditate. You know, I gave uh, the teacher. Um, Bob Roth, I gave, you know, Bob, I gave him to, to Oprah, to Ellen DeGeneres, mm -hmm. to countless other people who have big voices, and to lots of other friends who obviously just, you know, need it. But I've done, you know, I've done that. I, I like the idea of getting celebrities to meditate because then they get the rest of the world to meditate. It's a chain reaction. Someone like Oprah meditates, gets her staff to meditate, talks about it on TV, changes the world. Yeah. So that's why I wrote the book, to give more people access and to demystify well, let's back up to your, I mean, to you starting out. I mean, as, as, a, as a young kid, I mean, you were called Rush, was your nickname. I, I want to have you talk about why, why that was and, and just kind of go through where you went through in order to come across yoga and then eventually meditation and where you are today. So let's back up and take us through uh, Russell Simmons' life. I, I won't go through the whole thing, but I'm trying to capsulize it. I mean, I grew up in Queens. It was common amongst uh, young people in that community to take all kinds of drugs. You know, that whole epidemic, uh, heroin, then crack, hit our neighborhood. Um, so I partake, I took all kinds of drugs. Uh, I was in a gang. Uh, it was common for people in my, you know, I, my, to be in a gang, I was in one. So I had some, you know, some of those trappings that could have really led me astray in a bad way, and I escaped. Mm -hmm. 
And I, I, you know, I found a passion, as you know, music. I started Def Jam Records and a bunch of other companies, and and over the years have been, you know, more and more, um, you know, more. I become more at ease as I, as I uh, find more tools. The first thing I found, first thing I found was sobriety. I was 26 years ago. I was 30 and 56 now. Sobriety helped a great deal. Then I found yoga, the physical practice. That's 20 years ago. And then I found meditation right after that. And those things all have led me, I mean, as you meditate, you know that you become more compassionate. You know, you become more, um, your clarity sets in. You get to, to see what's in front of you instead of the noise that separates you from what's in front of you. Your brain is, you know, from your left side of your brain, right side of your brain, begins separating at age eight. Meditation brings it back together. You, your nervous system, you know, when it's not compromised and you build up a greater immune system and then you have a more clarity, more you can, your memory gets better. I mean, all the drugs, I forgot a lot of shit and kept forgetting. <laughs> so my memory is better because of it and my relationship with the world is better. And the number one thing I can say that meditation has done for me has made me a happier person, a much happier person. And so I wanted to share that. That's why I wrote the book. Yeah, well, you know, one, in the chapter in uh, Success Through Stillness, you actually talked about um, money and fame don't drown out the noise. That's one of the lines that you use. And, and you know so many people that are financially successful, very famous. You are yourself. And, uh, but that, you know, there's a tremendous amount of anxiety. I think it's a silly idea to think that that would be helpful. Money and fame would help us somehow. Well, that's what I mean, people pursue. Well, I know, it, but, but think of it. You know, um, life, all you need in life is a comfortable seat. I mean, we know that we seek more, and we're taught to seek more and, and, and chase things that aren't even necessarily healthy at all, you know, but, but it's, it's a fact that happiness is in the present moment, and the seconds that excite you, um, a, a sunset, um, you ever play basketball and you're in a zone, mm -hmm. play ball? In a zone, you can't miss, but you get to that point where you can't miss. Mm -hmm. Expansive is what your brain becomes. And, and, and then this idea of being present, fully awake, is one that's taught by every prophet over and over again. Different languages, different colors, different you know, uh, parts of the world, same rap. And so this idea of Christ consciousness, or nirvana, or samadhi, or taqwa, the Muslims call it, or this idea of being in union, or a state of yoga, is one that we're all seeking. All of us want bliss. We all want to be happy and at ease. And, you know, uh, things don't make you happy and at ease. But, you know, it's good. To, uh, you, uh, meditation makes you happy. There's no question. It increases happiness. And, but, but money doesn't make you happy. There's no question of that. There's too much research to prove that money doesn't make you happy. But there's also proof that happy makes you money. So if you think you want to be at ease and happy, and you uh, also, you know, have not an, a, alleviated the neediness for things and stuff, you know, which I, I like new stuff. If you think, you know, if you can, you know, let go of the neediness some, and operate more from abundance, from a happy space, you'll be more attractive. Neediness is the cause of suffering. Uh, needing nothing attracts everything, you know, and, and not suffering, you know. So it's, it's, Basic stuff, it's taught in every scripture, told by every prophet, and forgotten by, you know, this society in some cases. So it's good to bring it back. Oh, yeah, you say basic stuff that most people don't follow, most people don't do, and, and there's a tremendous amount of resistance to it. Until I recently, last year, I went through a four-day training in transcendental meditation in, in Fairfield, uh, Iowa, where the domes are, where Maharishi University is. The city of Fairfield gave me an, an award for my contribution in entrepreneurship, and that's why I went down there not realizing how much that I would be like, wow, and embrace this, because my whole life I had had the hardest time sitting still. Uh, it wasn't until I actually went through that training, it was the first time in my adult life where I even felt like some really serious dropping of the stress, the angst would be the word that I would use, that I would always run my life with in spite of a lot of success, in spite of a lot of just incredible relationships that I had, I always had this very dark cloud. And it wasn't until I got introduced to TM 
that I started feeling different. And I had people over the years that actually sat down and tried to teach me meditation, but I never could really adopt it. And so in your book, you actually take people through the, you know, all the obstacles. I don't have time. I don't have an environment where I can meditate. Why to do it in the first place? What does it do with the brain? So I'd love to have you speak to, um, you know, I love your testimonial. I mean, I should yeah. just leave. You hold the book you up could. and keep talking. But see, I need Russell Simmons to credentialize it, though, because it's great that a person is well No, I'm saying, you, oh, your shit is, you sound good. Yeah. You sound like you could be like, a, you know, a good at, you're a big advocate. I'm a, a huge advocate. I, I mean, mean, we I mean, had John I mean, Hagelin, uh, you know, uh, speak at, at my Genius Network conference. I mean, uh, I want to introduce right. this to as many people as possible. It's one of the reasons well, why I wanted I'm to talk to you to about it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's just, I mean, it's an obvious thing, you know, it's taught by, again, everybody's always talked about it for thousands of years. It's a simple tool. It's life-changing for those who live on the outside. The world is full of noise. The yogis have a second sutra in their scripture 6,000 years ago, Yoga Shitta Friti Narodaha. Yoga, or union with God, or what you call Christ consciousness, or Nirvana, or Samadhi, or whatever, Takwa, every religion, this space, yoga, this state happens with the cessation and the fluctuation of the mind. In other words, the number one goal of yoga to, is to quiet the mind, which is also um, the goal of all the good karmic deeds you do, and all the, the all the devotional work you do, and all the you know the singing and chanting and whatever religious practices you have are meant to put the mind at ease, so that you can then be in union with God. If that's you know religious thing, you say God. Or just to know the self, because the self knows it all. Self has answers for everything. And so as you meditate, you get close to that source. And, and so that ease, when the noise and the veil is lifted, that ease, that tranquility inside you is key. It's, it's everything. You know, you get shocks of it, you get a glimpse of it, but can you access it? And meditation helps you to access it more times than you might have otherwise. And that's all life's about, is digging deep. Well, is, uh, you even have a chapter in the book about it's not a religion. So what if someone's an atheist? What if they're like, oh, I can't do meditation because it goes against my religion? I mean, you even address uh, this obstacle. Yeah, that's what people say it all the time. A quiet time, we call it then. In school, you know, like the word yeah. meditation, call it quiet time. You know, what's wrong with sitting by yourself and letting your thoughts settle? Is that the devil's work? Yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> like, the Buddha even tell you, watch what, the fuck, watch what they tell you. Look for yourself. Right? Check for yourself. Because the preacher will tell you anything. Put him in the oven. Your mom might tell you anything. A rabbi could tell you anything. What do you think? And that takes quiet time to really dis determine what it is that inspires you and what it is you don't want to do. I, for instance, don't want to eat animals. Fuck, I'm not going to eat 40 billion, be part of the, the comic disaster, the greatest comic disaster in the history of the world. You know, abusing 40 billion animals and so we can get sick, destroy the environment, and take up all our natural resources. Uh, I don't want to be part of it because I just thought about it on my own without, you know, being told what to think. When did you come to that? I mean, 15 what years ago. Okay. I stopped eating animal products. David, let's ask Anna because Anna is also, uh, I think I have a copy back here. So... Anna's written, I don't know, a ton of books, but she's a New York Times bestselling author. She's a brilliant writer. Uh, she's a co-author with me. She literally is the one that did all the work here, even though this is the Miracle Morning for Addiction Recovery with uh, Seward says, how Elrod Joe uh, says Anna David in, in, in Joe Paul. She really should say Anna David because she put the most <laughs> work into writing this book. I was just literally talking and she put it into words. It's a great book. It really is a, an amazing book on uh, addiction recovery because that's, of course, my passion project. And uh, Anna's first book was called Party Girl, which is New York Times bestseller. Anna, you have a really cool book coming out. We're going to have you as a guest on I Love Marketing probably in a couple of weeks. So tell people about it because I think what the subject matter is, is really applicable to a lot of people right now because there's a lot of messes going on in people's lives. So Anna. Okay, thank you. The book is called Make Your Mess Your Memoir, and it's a new genre that I'm coining called a bizwar. So it's 10 chapters of memoir and four chapters of business. Basically, my messy life, how I went from just being a girl who did a lot of cocaine to being the first person the Today Show called when they had a story about addiction because I wrote a book about it. 
that book, Party Girl. And so basically my philosophy about it was, I love reading memoirs, except I don't learn enough. I love reading business books, except I get bored because there's not enough story. So I said, what if there could be a combination of both? Um, let's try it. So yes, Make Your Mess Your Memoir. It's coming out July 1st. And Joe really is into it because I have a chapter about him. Um, because tr truly what I learned from Joe was, was basically I had all these books and I, I was kind of broke. And then I got a mentor. And suddenly I was able to take this messy life, this great creative success and make it into a business. And so that's really what the book is about. Awesome. And you know what? Um, suggestions and recommendations on writing because you actually teach people how to write. Um, and a lot of people get stuck and hung up on that. And so much about what me and Dean um, do our best to try to help people with is write and writing doesn't always necessarily need to be sitting down and writing or typing. You could literally talk, but there's ways to assemble your words into messages. So what, what recommendations do you have for people that have, this difficulty, this obstacle with how to write? Well, I think it's important to know if you are a writer or if you want to write a book. And if and what your times, it probably is going to take a non-writer about 300 hours to write a book. So calculate if you want a book and your time, what that would cost, what you're worth an hour. It's probably a better idea to pay somebody else to do it. And as Joe said, to talk it through. Um, but if you in your heart really want to write, then, then sit down and do it. And, and the negative voices that tell you that you're no good are just, that's just part of the deal. And as Dorothy Parker said, writing is rewriting. And as Brene Brown says, you just get a shitty first draft out there and, um, and then you go back and you fix it. All right. So um, let's see. I want to say something that's actually hopefully useful. So this is my book, Life Gives to the Giver. And you can get this book for free at joesfreebook.com. And when you go to joesfreebook.com, you can also, um, oh, thank you. There's a couple of people holding it up. Appreciate it. Thanks, Dave. Um, you, you can get the physical version mailed to you if you pay for shipping and handling. Uh, that will not put you into any sort of uh, upsell funnel or anything. It's literally a free book. I was just putting it out for people right now. And it's a really great book. And it's a compilation of my three a week emails that I write. And we put out uh, And those those emails are written with a guy named JR, where I talk and he will write some of them others I will write. And it's the same way that Dean puts out three a week emails. A lot of what we do is we talk and then we have them written in, and they're edited, but there are words. I mean, it's it's what I say. And yeah. Anna assembled my three week emails, put it into a book and people love this. So the reason I'm bringing this up is everyone has riffs. They have things that you say, things you think about stuff that you say when you're selling. And part of selling is canning and cloning yourself so that what it is you say that people respond to, you want to put that in all kinds of different forms. And as uh, my genius network member, uh, Jason Fladlin, who's like the top webinar trainer in the world, he has this very simple line that I always repeat a lot where he's like, if you've got something that you're offering or selling, you want to put information in front of it. And when I was, you know, a dead broke carpet cleaner, the story that almost everyone that listens to I Love Marketing or anyone that's listening to any of my stuff, I always tell the story of the consumer awareness guide where the very first marketing, um, you know, information piece that I have was a consumer's guide to carpet cleaning where it, it would just teach people, you know, seven questions, ask a carpet cleaner before invite them into your home and all just, it was educational. And I would offer that as part of the lead generation. So instead of people calling me up and saying, how much do you charge? They would call and they would request that information before the internet in that one. That was my first piece of writing. And I actually paid a copywriter to write it for me And that consumer awareness guide was some, the very first thing I created when I was a dead broke carpet cleaner living off credit cards in 1992. And I knew I needed something to position me, but because I created that consumer awareness guide, it literally built a multi-million dollar business that with everything I've taught to other people based on that one seed that was planted has literally generated a couple billion dollars, like with a B in revenue 
for people that have used it. And so there's no telling, you know, the, the um, snowball effect of finding, you know, the right target audience and the right message and matching them with it. You know, it's, I mean, it, it, there's, I, I never would have guessed that the power of a sales letter mm. uh, and the power of words, um, you know, in writing. And that was also turned into consumer guides and then videos and everything like that. Who of you has come to after a very rough night, um, looked up at a friend, heard the friend go, oh, you're breathing and not even sounding that happy? Nobody. Okay, well, good. I can't say the same. It was the morning after my 26th birthday, which I had spent, I told all of my friends, which is to say all the people I did drugs with, to gather at a bar. And I said, don't bring me a present unless it's drugs. But drug addicts are not known for their listening skills or their present giving abilities. So nobody even listened to me except one friend, my friend Drew. And he comes up to me and he's like, I have your present. It's in the bathroom. I stole it from my roommate. And I think we can all agree it's better when a present isn't stolen, right? Mm -hmm. But I was not in a position to be picky. So I knew what he meant. Um, I go into the bathroom. I see like two lines of cocaine. And I take the dollar bill that I always had rolled up in my back pocket. And I snort the lines. And immediately, I'm like, the world, it's not like it goes upside down or sideways. But it's like, remember Rubik's Cubes? It was like it was being violently twisted by a demonic nine-year-old. I was suddenly like, oh my God, whoa. And I, I felt like I couldn't talk and I couldn't move, but I was standing and I was wide awake. So I was like, okay. So I did what felt like the most logical thing, which is like I look in the back of the bar and I, and I just make a beeline. And in the back, there's this parking lot. And in the parking lot, there's a dumpster. And this, by the way, is the cover of one of my recent books because I wrote about this experience in the book. And the dumpster was not on fire, but I was like a dumpster fire at this point in my life. And I go and I lie down next to the dumpster and I just kind of, that's how I spent my 26th birthday. And people would come out and, um, and be like, happy birthday. And, and no one seems surprised that that's how I was spending my birthday. And at the end of the night, I don't really remember this, but I guess two friends took me, put me in their car, and put me on their couch, and that's how I came to the next morning with my friend saying, oh, you're breathing, and not sounding that happy about it. Now, that would have been that, but a funny thing happened. In fact, a few funny things. One, I realized I was an addict, and I got sober. I went to rehab, and that was not November 19th. It'll be 19 years ago. I haven't had a drug or a drink since. Thank you. But the really interesting thing is I wrote a book about it. Now that book, Party Girl, happened to come out at a time when like Paris Hilton and Lindsay Lohan and all of these girls were making headlines for being party girls. So I started getting asked to go on TV to talk about the party girl phenomenon. That's a phenomenon, as it turns out. So I go on. Fox News, and then I go on the Today Show, and then I went on, I was on television hundreds of times over the last, the next 10 years, talking about the party girl phenomenon, writing articles about it. And um, it just blew my mind that I, like, my only expertise was in rolling up dollar bills and snorting drugs through them. I was, I was good at that. But I had no expertise in any other thing. And so then I realized what could happen when you wrote a book. And so then I ended up, and as Joe said in the intro, I ended up writing um, seven more, including one with him. Now, I said, when I started going on TV all the time, I said to my TV agent, like, this is ridiculous. I, I mean, talk about imposter syndrome. But should I go get a degree? Like, shouldn't I get like a master's in psychology or something? Because I'm going on, they're picking me over doctors to go on. And he looked at me like I was crazy. And he's like, a degree? Why would you need a degree? You have a book. And that's when I realized books really are the new degrees. And this is how I know this. This is where I went to college. Beautiful Trinity College, Hartford, Connecticut. We were talking about it last night. It's a lovely school. It's called a Little Ivy. Do you know how many people care that I went to? Does anyone here care that I went to Trinity College? 
oh, that's very sweet, Jason, but really nobody cares that I went to Trinity College. Do you want to know how many people I meet who care that I have written eight books and that one is a New York Times bestseller? Kind of like everybody I meet. And I'm not the only person this is true for. I did a story for Entrepreneur Magazine about entrepreneurs whose lives changed as a result of writing their books. Now, Sheryl Sandberg, great example. Mark Zuckerberg's number two, then she writes Lean In, and suddenly she's like the spokesperson for women worldwide, and like Lean In groups are launching everywhere. And then there's James Altucher, like kind of a random investor, or entrepreneur guy, writes this book, Choose Yourself, self-publishes, it sells 45,000 copies in its first month, and suddenly he's like everywhere <laughs> with his crazy hair. Um, and then there's someone you know, J.J. Virgin, four-time New York Times best-selling author. So I spoke to her for that article, and she said to me, if people read my books, they'll buy my products. We have a relationship. They just took you into their bedroom or their bathroom. Yeah, I mean, it's true, they do. Um, they feel like they know you. And then someone else you know. I spoke to Cameron for that uh, story, and we talked about Double Double. You told me I didn't even really want to write a book. I just wanted to increase my speaking fees. And they went from $15,000, I'm sure they're way more now, but they went to $30,000 after that book came out. But you said to me something I thought was even more interesting, which is, I'll run across people sharing my ideas every day on social media. That wouldn't have happened without my books. So, as it turns out, a crazy thing has happened. Authors, like the writers, the butt of every joke, we have become the celebrities today. We're the ones that are on red carpets and signing books and with our names on marquees. I mean, how did this happen? Like when I moved to Hollywood 20 years ago, the joke was, if you want to make sure you get nowhere in Hollywood, make sure you sleep with the writer. Like the writer has no power. So what has happened? I think that it's like we live in this insta-fame society where you can get famous. If you make a video of yourself sobbing, leave Britney alone, you, who remembers this guy? Four million views in two days. That guy became famous. He's now a porn star. I didn't even know that. Um, right, right. So anybody can get famous for anything. And so it's very exciting. Um, so authors are kind of the only ones with credibility anymore. But the problem is that traditional publishing is completely broken. I know this because I did six books with HarperCollins. And I watched my book deals go from, my final book deal was for $2,000. That means I probably lost about like $50,000 in terms of the time I spent working on it. These days, three in 10,000 book proposals written sell to traditional publishers. Three in 10,000. And those that do sell, the publishers don't do anything. What they do is they pick like one or two books a season, they put all the marketing, all the energy behind that. They're, it's always the low-hanging fruit, too. And then they leave the others to sort of flail in the wind. And I know this because I was one of the flailers. But I see this as a really good thing because the gatekeepers are gone. We don't need those people anymore. Anybody who has a story to tell can tell it. And any business person who is not telling it through a book is missing out on the most crucial aspect of their marketing. But there is another thing I've realized, and that is what we share in those books is so important. I have found that when I share those things that I, my biggest struggles, those things I'm most ashamed of, those things that I have, have been the greatest lessons, that's when the true freedom comes. Because it's like I get emails every day. I've been really vocal about my recovery for day one. And I get emails all the time telling me, I would never have come forward if it hadn't been for you, if I hadn't read this thing you wrote, if I hadn't seen this thing you said. 
And I'm not saying it to brag, I'm saying it because this is what happens when we put our ideas into books. And there's another thing. You know, I have done every, like I have done therapy since I was 16. I have done 12 steps since the year 2000. I have done EMDR trauma therapy. I have done everything. I even do all that like crazy shit that Joe always talks about, the floating and the freezing and the like everything. I wrote a story for Psychology Today about trying cryotherapy as a treatment for depression. I kind of think it worked too. But my point is I have never found the kind of freedom I have found from sharing about my struggles in a book is greater than any of that. So all you have to do to find your book is ask yourself two questions. One, what are my audience's pain points? It's a secret, write it down. <laughs> and two, what lights up my soul? Find those two things and you have your answer. Now, this is what James Altucher told me when I spoke to him for this story. I wanted people to know how hard it is to fail, to confess mistakes in a world where everyone pretends to be perfect. It was this very style of writing that multiplied my readers by 100 times. So that is my message to you. Figure out your story. Share your story. Let it launch you to a new level. Possibly save a life, and it might even be your own. How many people have business cards? Raise your hand if you use business cards. All right, so what I do is at my Rockstar Marketing Boot Camps every March and September, I try to convince people to never use business cards again, to only use their books, handing out books instead of business cards. In my other life, I used to tour with the band Air Supply. I was the band's personal assistant. And after that, I toured with the band Guns N' Roses. I was blessed to be Axl Rose's personal assistant. I was basically a glorified babysitter. I carried $25,000 in cash with me at all times to get him out of trouble. That was my job. So I, I've done that, and but in all the years that I toured with these bands, I never ever saw a rock star hand out a business card and say, like Axel would go up to a person, hey, we have a concert happening down the street. Here's my business card. Call me if you want a ticket. So if you want to be a rock star in your business, if you want to be the best in your business, stop handing out business cards like everybody else does. I hand out books, and that's what I'm going to share today, why you need to hand out books. Everyone hands these things out. Yuck. So I hand out rock star business cards, and ever since I changed this one thing, I changed, instead of handing out business cards, I hand out books. I get on stages all across the country, and my business has taken off through the roof. Uh, I'm going to give you an example. This is the book that I hand out all the time instead of business cards. I'm going to give you an example of a product that was out in 2008, and they made one little tweak to their business that changed everything for them. The name of the company was called Shreddies, and it was a little cereal that was like little bitty shredded wheats. And what they did was in 2008, they said, we are making no money. We got to make more money. How are we going to make more money? So they made one little tweak to their ad campaign, and they introduced the new Diamond Shreddies. Now, if you look closely, you're going to notice that it's the same freaking thing. It's <laughs> someone took the photographer, tweaked the square and made it into a diamond, and all of a sudden you had a totally different product. They took it to the next level and they had combo packs. They had the nerve to sell combo packs of square and diamond shreddies. And I looked at that and said, they took it to another level. They had contests. Which do you like better, square shreddies or uh, uh, diamond shreddies? Point being this, one little tweak, that's all they did, one little tweak changed everything in their business. And that's what I'm hoping to do to you today, to get thinking to use books instead of business cards, throw those away. Um, I made a tweak. I was going to have a really, I was going to write, when I first started speaking 10 years ago, I was going to write this big, gigantic marketing book, about 300, 400 pages, pages, the Bible of marketing. I was going to just, I was so excited about writing a big, large book. It was looking something like this. It was going to be like, do good marketing, really good. Good. Six, 5,641 extremely long tips that will take you years to read and even longer to implement. And Joe Polish, being the forward thinker that he is, he wrote a testimonial for me for this large book even before I met him. That's how good he is. The testimonial for this really large book was, this is the perfect book for the person who hates using drugs and alcohol to induce sleep. The, in fact, there are so many chapters in this book that it put me to sleep for 600 nights straight. The added cleverness of this unique writer is because the book is so long, when you finally finish it, you can read it again from the beginning because you won't remember anything about what you learned in chapter one. Joe Polish. So thank you, Joe, wherever you are. You're a giver. 
<laughs> so I teach people to write small books, because if you write big books all the time, you can't hand those out because they're expensive to print. So I teach people to write small books and give them out as business cards. So I'm going to have a handout for you after this. I'm going to be giving you a handout so you don't have to write anything down. Just enjoy, just enjoy this wacky stuff that you're about to hear. So there are six books that you can write right now to promote your business and, and use them as a business card. Number one is a book of quotes, just a quote book. If you're a leadership coach, a teacher on leadership, you teach on leadership, you could go to Google right now and just get your 50 favorite leadership quotes and just put them in a book and give the credit to the person that said the quote, put your name on the cover and then the book on the name and your picture on the front cover and you have a business card. And you could all do that by tonight. Number two is your program. I have a book, My Rockstar System for Success. It's basically the acronym Rockstar, R-O-C-K-S-T-A-R, and it's my book on my Rockstar system of marketing. A bullet points tip book is another one, quick bullet points that you can write. My son, at 10 years old, wrote a book on blogging. He used to blog on a game called Club Penguin, and we're so proud of him, he was ki teaching kids how to cheat on Club Penguin. We're very excited about this. And so he did this blog, and he had 50,000 subscribers on his blog, and we're like, what the hell are you doing, child? And we, and we, and he, uh, we told him, you've got to write a book. So he wrote this book, he speaks on stages all across the country, and he makes a lot of money. And this is him speaking at my, his first seminar, he spoke on my stage, he made $1,200 in 15 minutes, and he looked at my wife and I, we're so proud, and he says, Mom, Dad, I figured it out. I don't need to go to school anymore. <laughs> and we're like, no, 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 wrong message. And, and no, he's like, no, do the math. If I do this every 15 minutes, I make more than 10,000 a day, and he's right. <laughs> So, but don't, bullet points. Um, number four, best interviews. You all do podcasting, or a lot of you do podcasting. Take those podcasts, get them transcribed, and turn them into a book. Just, it's easy. You have it already, repurposing material. Number five, top blog posts. If you don't like writing books because it's overwhelming, you do 25 blog posts over time, and then you take your top 25 most popular blog posts for 2016, and you turn them into a book. And lastly, it's a compilation book. This is a book that everyone here is going to get today. It's called Rockstar Success Stories. Uh, there's Dean Cain, who is Superman. Um, Derek Hall, who is the president and CEO for the Arizona Diamondbacks here in town. Lots of great stories about entrepreneurs that made it great. So it's a compilation book. You write one chapter and get all your friends to write all the other chapters. You could crank it out like that and use that as a business card. Rockstar Success Stories. What I mainly do in life is I teach outside the box marketing techniques. These are, you, some of you are going to say, you're crazy, you're wacky, there's no way I'm doing any of these things that you're going to suggest, but you might think differently the next time you're marketing your business, because all I do is teach people what to do, what everyone else does not do. So you might not use any of these principles, but it'll make you think differently. First one is uh, called, so these are how to market your books, right? First one is called Pissed Rockstar. So I wrote a book called Welcome to My Jungle, and Axel Rose calls me up and he says, I hear you're writing a book. And I said, yes, I am. And he goes, I don't want you to write a book. And I said, well, it's too late. I already wrote it. And he said, what, well, what are you sharing? And I said, I'm not going to share anything secret about it. It's just funny things that happened on the road. And he said, that's it. If you release this book, we're enemies. I said, Axel, you're overreacting. Just read the book first. He said, nope, we're enemies. In fact, I'm going to tell everyone at my concerts not to buy your book. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, Thank you, God. <laughs> I'm like, really? So have, an, have a rock star piss, you, you, piss, piss, pissed off and tell everyone not to write your book. Well, you know what I mean. Next one is called Open House. I love this one, to sell your books. You put a real estate sign on the front lawn of your house like everyone else does. And people just come to your house because they want to see your house. But when they go to your house, they're not really going to buy the house, you're going to be sitting there with your books, and you say, oh, this isn't an open house for this. I'm not selling my house. I'm selling my books. Would you like to buy one? And what happens is two things could happen. One, they're going to be, wow, that's really creative, and they buy a book. Or two, they're going to be pissed off. What are you doing? This, you, and I'm like, you walked in here. I didn't walk in here. What are you talking about? So you can't even get in trouble from this one. <laughs> the next one is called 47 Stamps. I get, I send my book out to guest bloggers all the time. And I, instead of putting uh, a a regular stamp out to everybody. I put 47 one cent stamps on the envelope because just out of curiosity, the guest blog is like, I got to open this. This guy's insane or he has a lot of time on his hands. I don't understand this. So put 47 one cent stamps on the outside of an envelope. Uh, next one, 2,000 names. Next time you write a book, when you write a book tonight, in the back of the book, under the acknowledgements, 
Think back in time of every person you've ever met in kindergarten, first grade, second grade, and put them in the book and say, I'd like to thank the following people. And then you call them and say, hey, remember me from kindergarten? Well, you are such an impact in my life. I put you in my book. And what happens is they've never been in a book before, so they buy 10, 20, because they're giving them to everybody that they know. And look, I'm in a book, I'm in a book, this is great. So that's 2,000 names. Next one, public library. Did you know that you can have your friends, those same friends that you had in kindergarten, first grade, you call everyone across the country and you tell them, call your public library, your local public library, and tell them to order my book. The public library will actually buy the book and put it in the library and give it to the person. So it's a great way, if you have thousands of friends, to get, A, your book in public libraries and make more sales because the library will buy your book. And uh, lastly, second to last, uh, airplane seats. Every time I go on a flight, I carry 10 to 15 of my books, and as I'm walking down the aisle to my seat, I just put my books in the aisles, <laughs> in the back seat. <laughs> because listen, what else are you gonna do on a flight? You've read the Sky Mall 400 times, right? And I swear to you this is true. I was on a, uh, a flight, a uh, Southwest flight. Mike Tyson walks in, and he sits in the front seat, front center, uh, first seat right on the aisle, and he picks my book out, and he starts reading it. And for the four-hour flight, he got to page three, or something like that. <laughs> I'm joking, I'm joking. But anyway, I, w I wanted to take a picture of him so bad, but I was afraid he'd beat me up, so I didn't. But I wish I had that picture. And last but not least, the most incredible marketing tip you will ever hear. And you know you tell a joke sometimes, and you, you, tell the, you say, this is really funny, and you oversell it? I can't even oversell this one. It's so good. It is the best marketing tip you will ever hear. So I'm going to share it with you now. Are you ready? Yes. Okay, here it is. So you take about 10 or 15 of your small books, because they fit really nice in a backpack, and you walk into your local bookstore or an airport gift shop or a hotel lobby gift shop, and you go, and like I take 15 books in my backpack, and I walk into Barnes & Noble, and I'll say, hmm, where would my book look good in this store? <laughs> and I go, <laughs> I go to the marketing section, and I kneel down, and I take the books out of my book, and I put them on the bookshelf, and that's called reverse shoplifting. <laughs> You know, there are people that spend two and three thousand dollars to go to seminars to learn how to get their books on bookshelves. I'm like, what's so hard about this? You put them there yourself. I don't get it. So this is what I do. I always put mine next to Tony Robbins. <laughs> and then I do one more thing. I always have an extra book on the way out. There's always that display for New York Times bestsellers. I put mine under number one and I take a picture and I leave. Thank you guys so much. So what would be um, like kind of some, the action kit for somebody who's thinking, I want to start maybe exploring about, or maybe it feels like, because you'd probably know it when you're in the middle of it. If people on reflection right now, thinking about their own situation and where they're positioned in the marketplace on that matrix, or mm. they're struggling, maybe they're trying to um, keep up. What's the what what's the first kind of where do we start to maybe explore this or think about this? Well, it's so funny you should ask, Dean. I well, have a, I <laughs> wouldn't it be great if there was some <laughs> kind of great? Like yeah. process for this? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Maybe if somebody who's written the New York Times just, Yeah, just book you know, like, kind of for instance on a journey through it. Yeah. I mean, um, I, uh, I, you know, Dean, I was so excited when you invited me to be, to, to be here. And so I talked to my team and I said, I, I have an idea of something that, um, is different than a traditional book launch. The book is not finished. Mm -hmm. Not only does the book not have a publication date, but, um, but I want to give away kind of a, a sampler platter mm -hmm. to the people who are joining us today, who are, who are, who are listening to our conversation. So, um, I'm, I'm going to give you a URL okay. and when you go to the URL, you're going to be able to download a mini sample of the book. So you can, you can tell me what you think. Well, and here like it that. is. Okay. It's sallyhogshead.com forward slash. I love marketing all one word, not case sensitive. Well, that's sallyhogshead.com forward slash. I love marketing. And now my, um, uh, my team, as you know, they they have they're off on their 
their team retreat, but before they left yesterday, they showed me the page and it's, it's, it's just, it's simple. And it mm -hmm. makes the point that you can't just say different, you have to be different. And how do you take the concept of a book launch and deconstruct it? What, what, what if, what if there's no cover? What if there are 10,000 different covers? What if, what if That's we what have I'm a, excited about is to see, yeah. that, you know, that now there's, um, yeah, there's very, you know, you. I loved because you and I have had a conversation about this launch, uh, the, creating the uh, the book that you're going through it and creating the book as we go kind of thing. Yes. Uh, which is really kind of great. I love that. And so, uh, so. Uh, so, so here's what it is. I took, I, I took, I don't know, 10 or 12 pages that are sort of representative of the content of the book and um, uh, put it together in a PDF. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then at the end, I'll, I'll, I'll say, if you want to give me feedback on this, then uh, here's, here's a, just, you know, hit, click the link, go into the Google doc. And it's, it's asking you five questions. Mm -hmm. How would you apply this? What did you find most useful? Yes. Uh, 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 is this concept valuable to you? And, um, and and I also go through that process. I start to give a hint of what does it mean to be different? Which of those six emblems, those six mm -hmm. emblems of being different, um, uh, could you tap into and here's how that you can mm -hmm. begin to apply them. Like um, and and once, you, once you understand what makes you different, how can you continue to take that further and further and further and further so it becomes so refined that people become obsessed with you instead of just mildly interested in you? I love it. I mean, that's so great. You want to get like, uh, instead of hate mail, you want to get hate mail. Because yeah, yeah. Of, like, stalker <laughs> yeah. mail. Is that what <laughs> you're saying? You're, yes. Yes. Like, yeah. fan mail. Yeah. That um, is so funny. And uh, and Dean, in one of our conversations, you, I was saying, I know I want to write a book, but I really hate book launches. I get really, it, 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 it feels like you're throwing a birthday party and you don't know if anybody's actually going to show up. And, uh, and so, um, so I said, well, if I don't, if I don't do a book launch, what if I just release the book over the course um, of limited editions where oh, each so edition I was actually has about doing a, a limited edition yeah. with you. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Yeah, we're gonna do we're gonna do yeah. a Dean Jackson limited edition. Love and that. the only way that you can you can get the Dean Jackson limited edition is through you. Yeah, and yeah. so it it's gonna be customized. I'm gonna I'm gonna spill all the beans. I'm gonna give mm. so much dirt, Dean. You're gonna you're oh. gonna you're gonna wish you'd burned them. You hear that? This is good. This is good. Yeah. When they watch your videos they're going to do it on their computer, in their office. Maybe in the future they're going to do it sitting on their couch in their living room if they have a smart TV, if they watch your videos. If they listen to your audios when they listen to your audios, they're going to do it in the car, they're going to do it on their MP3 player, they're going to do it when they're working out. It's my job to get you between the sheets with your customers. And not for a little bit of time either. I, I want to get you into bed with your customers and your potential customers for like seven to 10 hours, <laughs> even longer if they like to do it slowly. <laughs> uh, you know, we're not talking about Sting and Trudy stuff. We're talking about books, of course, right? And it's really not about geography. It's not about where they're hearing your message. It's how they're hearing your message. And books are one of the best ways to communicate a gigantic amount of information to a gigantic amount of people at the same time and have almost their entire mind share. When they're watching videos, they're doing something else. They're playing with their iPad, the, the window's minimized in the background. They're making phone calls. They're working out while they're listening to audio. Reading a book is one of the last things that human beings do and focus on nearly completely. Okay. How many people in the room have had their, have had their lives changed by a book? Okay. How many people in the room have had, have had their lives changed by a tweet? Right. Okay. Not even close. That's the power of books. What I do is get six and seven figure advances for big platform authors so they can do three things. One, first and foremost, is to, is to change the world, hopefully for good. Second is to enhance the value of their core businesses. And third is to make a little bit of money in the process. Uh, this whole publishing thing wasn't always a career. I used to be in politics. I ran a lobbying firm in Washington, D.C. You can boo now. Yeah, it really is a slimy business. Uh, every story you've ever heard about D.C. is true. It's probably only half the story. And I left D.C., and I was looking for what to do with my life, and so I figured that since I'd already sold my soul once, I'd make the perfect investment banker. we have any bankers in the room? Uh, good, good. Um, 
decided I didn't want to do that. I didn't want that lifestyle. I didn't want to spend 18 hours a day, seven days a week, staring at spreadsheets in a cubicle, no matter how much they were going to pay me. And I figured that one of the things that I liked to do more than, more than anything else in the world was to write. But I had no idea how an idea became a book. I mean, everybody's seen that Schoolhouse Rock, how a bill becomes a law, right? But there's no Schoolhouse Rock for books. So I went to a friend, right? So I went, I went to a friend whose husband was a best-selling author. I said, how did he get his first book deal? And she said, actually, it was, I, I don't really know. It was before we met. Why don't, you, why don't you talk to him? Took the guy out for a beer. And he said, hell, I just wrote the damn thing. And my agent did the rest. And my jaw hit the floor. Your agent, what are you, like a movie star? You've got an agent? The guy was five foot six, he weighed maybe 130 pounds, he had less hair then than I do now. He said, no, my, my, my literary agent, the woman who does all my book deals. I said, that's a job? He said, yeah, and I asked, can you make a living doing that? He said, well, she makes 15% of everything I make and she's got like 49 other clients. And that's when the light bulb went off in my head and I realized that my two favorite things in the world were books and deals. And there was this job where I could do book deals for a living. So that's what I do. So how many of you in the room would like to write a book in the next two or three years? Okay, fantastic. When it is your time to write a book, what I'm about to tell you is going to save you hopefully a year of your time and, let's say, give you $250,000 worth of value at the very least. You are probably, if you're like 75% of first-time authors, going to make the same mistake in that you are going to choose to write the wrong first book. There are four reasons, Four primary reasons that people buy nonfiction books. I'm going to tell you what all of them are. There are actually seven reasons why people buy them, but there are really four that are most relevant for this crowd, okay? The first reason people buy nonfiction books is to solve a problem they know they have. And the second part of that sentence is equally important as the first. To solve a problem they know they have, they have to know that they have the problem. If you're trying to help them solve a problem they don't know they have, you're not an author, you're an evangelist, and you're not going to make any money doing it. You would much rather be the guy out there selling the Bibles than the guy out there preaching the word, regardless of how much money uh, all these mega pastors are making, right? So if they have that problem, if they're overweight and they need to, like JJ says, drop seven foods, lose seven pounds in seven days, she's helping them solve that problem, okay? Number two, the second reason that people buy nonfiction books is to take advantage of an opportunity that they believe exists. The opportunity doesn't even necessarily have to exist, but if they believe it's there, you can sell them a book to take advantage of that opportunity. Okay? Take uh, Brendan Burchard, for instance, The Millionaire Messenger. Uh, make a difference and a fortune sharing your advice with others. Or Brendan's second book, The Charge, activating the 10 human drives that make you feel alive. If you can give them that message and allow them to achieve what they believe they can achieve, they will pay you $25 for a book. The third reason people will buy books is to learn more about a subject they're already fascinated by. That's why celebrity books do well. It's, uh, it's largely a, well, because if you're, if you're working, in, like let's say you're Paris Hilton. The four most depressing words in the English language are Paris Hilton, best-selling author. <laughs> Twice, but why? Because people are fascinated by her and they're fascinated by the lifestyle they lead, by the lifestyle she lives. And that leads us to number four. The fourth reason why people buy nonfiction books is to live vicariously through the lives of other people, good, bad, and indifferent. The best books will combine multiple categories. A great weight loss book will help you solve that problem and will show you a vision of the person you know you can be. A good personal finance book will solve your money problems or show you how to solve your money problems and let you aspire to something that's even greater than you ever thought possible. If you can combine those things and put them together with platform, writing, credentials, and ideas, you can have a bestseller like so many of the folks in this room. The most important word in the book business right now is platform. Why? And what is a platform? Platform is your ability to let people know your book exists and then get them someplace where they will plunk down their hard-earned $25 to buy it. Why? Because traditional publishers, and most of what I do is dealing with traditional publishers, most of what they do is taking good ideas and making them better. Working with literary agents like me, working with authors like you, to package ideas in a way that readers will find, will find them valuable. They're really good at designing those books. They're really good at warehousing those books. They're really good at getting to the to places where people are going to want to buy them. What they're really not good at is convince somebody to, convincing somebody to pick that book up and take it out the door or to actually hit the buy button online. And that's where you come in. Your ability to get somebody to buy your book 
is your platform. So if you can combine the platform with the writing, the good news is, even if you're not a great writer, I mean, Rick Frischman, who's, uh, who's had, how many books has Rick had published, Michael? Do you know? Uh, Rick, Rick's had like 13 or 14 books published, hasn't written a word of any of them himself. The, the, you can always get a writer to write your book if that's not what your strength is. Package, if you package the platform and the writing and the credentials and the idea, that's the recipe for a New York Times bestseller. So I'm going to wrap things up by talking about the state of the book business right now. People two years ago were talking about gloom and doom, how books were disappearing, how nobody was going to be able to make a living writing anymore. The demise of the book business has been greatly exaggerated. Right? The publishing business has been around since 1600. The first book that Gutenberg printed was the Bible. And the old saw goes that the second book that was printed on Gutenberg's press was a book about the demise of publishing. We are one of the most exciting times in the world right now when gatekeepers no longer are keeping you from reaching the people who, who, want and who, who want and who need to hear, who want and who need to hear your ideas. No longer are, is some guy in Manhattan or some woman at a cocktail party in Brooklyn going to be able to stand between you and the person whose life you can change. People read more now than they have at any other time in human history. 20 years ago, if you wanted to connect with somebody, what did you do? You picked up the phone. 100 years ago, you might have sent them a telegraph. Now, you send them a text. If you can leverage the ability to write, there are always going to be guys like me who can help you figure out a way to make a little bit of money from it, too. So I don't actually consider myself to be in the book business anymore. I'm in the artist management business. I take people who have fantastic ideas and fanatical followings, package them together, and come up with life-changing products. How many people in the room want to do that? Cool. All right, so I'm, uh, I'm more or less out of time here, so I'll, I'll give the stage back to Joe, but I hope that was, uh, hope this was worthwhile for you. Thank you. Okay, I hope you found that video awesome and useful, so if you want to get a free copy of my book, I want you to click here. And if you want to watch some more videos that will be useful and awesome, click here. Go ahead. Get over here. Do it now. Come on. Thank you. Watch them.